All conditional phenomena are like a dream, an illusion, a bubble, a shadow, morning dew, or a flash of lightning. All sentient beings. Mm -hmm. All sentient beings will definitely die. All inanimate things will definitely perish. This principle also applies to my body, which is composed of the four great elements. I will be separated from my family and friends one day. Time is pushing my age forward. Early youth is followed by the robust years of life, which is followed by old age, which is followed by death. Sounds or flowing water never return after they are gone. The thoughts and words of this very moment have already become impermanent. I will come closer and closer to death. Death has no set time to it. I could go to the next world at any moment simply because of my breathing. I can't take any worldly possessions whatsoever with me to the next world, these principles apply to my very own body.
To the Buddha, I return and rely, vowing that all living beings profoundly understand the great way and bring forth the Bodhi mind. To the Dharma, I return and rely, vowing that all living beings deeply enter the Sutra and have wisdom like the sea. To the Sangha, I return and rely, vowing that all living beings apply love and compassion to all. Namo di Sanshi Dorji Champo. 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 Last time I was sitting here, I talked about the 100-foot pole. And if you were here, you know what I'm talking about. And if you weren't, just imagine being on a 100-foot pole. And so three weeks ago, Tuesday, I jumped off yet again another hood, a foot pole. And um, I'm um, recovering pretty darn well. Um, I've got still some restrictions and um, I'm struggling the most with my voice still. Apparently there was a fair amount, in fact, a lot of inflammation and redness in my um, esophagus and my larynx. So I have tea and water and um, drops that I'll be using and I will, um, may have to stop. So take what you can from what I have to offer. We've been studying the three types of prajna. Anybody know what those are? Remember? I had some really loud mic we can't hear you language prajna contemplative aluminum prajna and prajna and what prajna intrinsic reality intrinsic reality prajna yeah yes that's what i didn't say <laughs> <laughs> intrinsic reality prajna contemplative illumination Prajna and language Prajna. How's it going for you? And this is a rhetorical question. <laughs> and I, it's a true question, I really, and a, and a rhetorical one. I want you to really think for a second how is it going for you? And not just while you're sitting here. And not just when you're sitting on the cushion, but when you're in the car, when you're in the grocery store, when you're with your family, when we, you're with yourself. How's it going for you? And if you were to re evaluate your language, Prajna, my guess is most of you are going to pre be pretty darn good. You're going to be able to, if I ask, you're going to be able to just recount all sorts of language. And that's a good thing. Until it's not. Buddha Master states, with these three kinds of prajna, one can contemplate, bring together and awaken to all the wondrous principles of reality contained in the language of the Heart Sutra. These three kinds of prajna are essential to what we're studying, to the Heart Sutra. As long as you use your mind to think things over, he says, 
Don't even imagine that you will see your original nature. Say that again. As long as you use your mind to think things over, don't even imagine that you will see your original nature. So now what do you do? The mind is king, right? As long as a tiny cause of thought arises in your mind, even if it is very subtle, even if it is subtle to the extreme, it will cause the truth of emptiness to immediately reverse and become a hindrance of an ordinary person, a hindrance that will shackle you. If thoughts are arising in your mind, then you are in an then you are an ordinary person. Even with good thoughts, you are still an ordinary person. There are differences in the depth of the attainment of prajna, the first step of realization. So there's differences. Language prajna means reliance on language as an expedient means to completely understand the text and is to be con contemplated. So we need the language. We need to learn it. We need to understand it. Buddha Master goes on to say, one should contemplate, con come to understand, and practice according to such principles. Contemplate. This is language prajna. By understanding the text, you contemplate and illuminate and see the essence of intrinsic reality prajna. You have to understand the text. You can't just read it page after page after page. You have to sit with it, go to essence with it, feel it. Engage with it. Allow it to be present with you. Notice where it shows up with you. Honor it. Respect it. We all, all of us, every living being has the prajna intrinsic reality that is prajna. We all have it. What gets in the way? What gets in the way of our prajna intrinsic reality that is prajna? I want you to really consider and think about that. Not what gets in my way. Not gets in the way of your neighbor. What gets in your way? So just take a second and consider this. Buddha Master has the answer, and the answer is simple. What gets in the way is karmic hindrances. Born of avidya, since beginning this time. So we're carrying this load with us since beginning this time. How heavy is that backpack? I don't know if any of you have been out backpacking, but when I lived in Alaska, <clears throat> we'd go on some big backpacks, backpack trips. And beginning at that first step, that backpack was really heavy. Because all your food, all your items for the next two weeks was on your back. One year while I was in Oregon, I <clears throat> went backpacking with a friend up at the Malawas and I took my golden retriever up. She was a great hiker, but I wasn't gonna carry her food. So for a week in advance, I put a doggy pack on her. She was not 
pleased. In fact, she stood outside and wouldn't move. Made me embarrassed, because the whole neighborhood knew her. And we practiced, and we practiced. Put more things in, and we practiced. We got on the trail. We had to hike way up. Begin. We were doing Eagle's Cap. We're going to be gone for a week. And she took off, which she never does. And I thought, oh, dear God, she doesn't usually do this. And then pretty soon, she's a happy dog. She came back with her tail wagging and a smile on her face and no backpack. <laughs> now, that's one way of taking care of your backpack. <laughs> but our karma is not that easy. And I said, buddy, you are not eating my food. So I kind of walked, both of us, my friend and I, walked towards the direction she was coming from. How in the world are we ever going to find a backpack? And we did. Somehow she got hooked up on a tree that a tree limb that was down and got hooked up and the pack came off. And she just stood there like, oh my God. <laughs> you found it, it's coming back. <laughs> And that was the end of her losing her pack. But the point being is that packs are not comfortable. And by the end of the trip, they're a lot more comfortable. But to begin with, and then we, in this particular trip, had to climb switchbacks for quite a while to get to the top of the trail. Trying to move this. So Buddha Master says, karma kindred says, born of a vidya since beginningless time is what gets in the way. And in order for intrinsic reality to appear, you must forget both personhood and dharmas and realize the emptiness of the six great elements. That's a tall order. But it's to get to the intrinsic nature. As an osteo, as a naturopath once said to me, what are you willing to do to feel better? You know, that has always stuck with me. That was years ago. What are you willing to do to feel better? And in the end, you must let go of those dharmas that you have learned. After the dharma has taken you to the other shore, it's just like letting go of a raft that has taken you to the other shore. If you got to the other shore, you want to pick that rubber raft up and carry it with you through trees and bushes and shrubs, up hills and down hills. I bet not. What are you willing to do to feel better? You are not attached to any kind of feeling of consciousness. Only at this time can prajna reality appear. You must go beyond words to where the path of language is cut off. You must go beyond words to where the path of language is cut off. So you can't just stay with, I'm reading this and it's really good and oh, I'll read this and oh, I'll read that. You must go beyond words where the path of language is cut off, where you yourself directly attain realization and awakening. It's just right there. In order to realize your original nature, you must cut off the path of language and extinguish attachment to mental activity. Another tall order. That's a big ask. You must cut off the path of language and extinguish attachment to mental activity. Are you ready? Are you willing to do that? Uh -huh. 
And finally, he says, to manifest the principles of intrinsic reality prajna, one should rely upon the utilization of contemplative illumination prajna. For me, I think of it as the middle path. The beginning path is the language prajna, learning, reading, engaging with, discussing, embracing, holding deeply, applying it, cultivating it. And then we go to contemplative illumination. Now that's not say so you do this and then you do this and then finally you get that. It's all together. But you've got to get the command of understanding and learning and growing and then you be with it. You sit with it. You practice it. You notice it. You see what comes up. You check in. And you don't check out. Therefore, one should take contemplative illumination prajna at one's, as one's purpose, using it as a fundamental guide and specific direction toward becoming a Buddha. With the utilization of contemplative illumination prajna, you illuminate the emptiness of the mind of delusive thoughts. You can then achieve the unborn, imperishable, true mind, and can naturally remove karmic obstacles such that all is perfectly clear. Then, then you can do that. In other words, turning inwardly without using a mind of stray thoughts, one applies one's own contemplative illumination Prajna to attain the state of intrinsic reality, Prajna. How wonderful. How do you get to contemplative illumination, Prajna? How do you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, how do you all, how do we all get to contemplative illumination, Prajna? That is not a rhetorical question. I'm looking for people with microphones to let me know how you do the practice. And I will ask that we all go to essence with this so that we don't spend a lot of time because I don't have much time with the throat and I have more to say. So but I do want to check in with y'all and see where you're at with how you get to contemplative, not how you do contemplative. What's the difference, Reba says? I'm not sure that what I'm doing is true. No, I'm not sure that what I'm doing is true contemplative illumination. That's a question I ask. But there's something that happens, and it's only started happening a few months ago, not, not for a long time. As I'm concentrating, I can go for a fairly decent period of time with no thought, whatever that means. I don't mean a whole minute, but a period of time with no thought. And I'm aware of my breathing. Um, and I'm, can I stop you for a minute? Because that's my next question. What you're on to now is an answer. I'm wondering how you get to... That's what I'm talking about, how I'm getting to it. No, before you even sit down, before you even sit down to contempt, to do the practice, how do you get there? What do you do to prepare yourself? Oh, so to that prepare myself. When you sit down. Oh. Because it's um, not just about landing on the seat and boom, it goes, right? You've got to walk in. There's a quietness. Is that what you're after? I'm, 
I mean, I don't I exactly understand the gist with the preparation, but um, there's a decision that I'm going to mm -hmm. do it. I'm going to attempt to go there. Okay. That that's my goal. That I want to do that. And that I'm in a place where my mind is not filled with what has to be done or what I'm going to do in the daytime. And, and I have to be in a quiet place where I'm not going to be disturbed. And I think I must already be in, on the way to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's just, there's, there's a, there's a push, there's a drive, there's a wanting that I respond to. Yeah, is that? Well, yes, leading to, thank you. Because we can't go to doing or participating in contemplative until we are ready. How do we prepare? How do we get to that place? For me, I find um, to light incense and to bow. For me, the lighting of the incense and the, the physical sensation of hitting that The lighting of the incense and the physical. So for me, it's, um, I'm a very physical person. My senses get me ready. And I find that to bow, to physically feel the lighting of the lighter, the smell of that incense coming to me. And then starting off with opening my heart and myself to the arousal for wanting to awaken. Okay. Okay. Oh. Um, depending on what time of day it is that I'm going to sit, um, if, if the tattoos haven't been done, I can write them down and get them somewhere else. But the preliminary practices that we've been taught mm -hmm. um, are a way for me just to uh, prepare. Um, I do this regularly. Okay. Okay. So that's how we prepare. And I would say, even before that, even before you the space, even before you get up in the morning or you come through the door at night, even before, and even before that, and even before that, and even before that, and even before that, and even before that. Continuously. Continuously. So it's an abiding willingness. It's, an, it's a presence with you. It's a presence with you. When you go to the gym and you work out with weights, you don't go home and then do nothing with lifting or moving or anything. You continue to do the usage of those muscles. You continue to use those muscles. 
And we've been talking about that quite a bit. And and Buddha Master says, what is it? Cultivation, right? You walk it out and you walk it out and you walk it out and you bring it with you. You add a little bit of difference into your backpack. You mix it up. When you are backpacking for real on a trail, you put the things you need right away or may need at the top. So you can grab it or on a side fanny or whatever you got. You have it accessible. You have your water bottle accessible. What do you bring off the cushion to make these things we're learning accessible to you? As you go from morning till night, hither and yarn. So of course, then the next question, which Sukha was getting to is, how do you practice contemplative illumination prajna? Now that can take a lot of description, but I want you just to sit quietly and consider, now you've <clears throat> brought what you need to your place of where you're gonna do your practice, whatever that might be. Now it doesn't have to be at the altar. And it, has to, it doesn't have to be the only time. It doesn't have to be one of those boxes you check off. What do you do? And just take a minute and consider. Consider what you do to practice contemplative illumination prajna. I suggest that practicing silence, not just on the cushion or in the retreat that you might be attending, but throughout your day, that will give you space, that will give you room, that will give you the muscle to open to contemplative illumination prajna. Silence. Often reserved for church, Temple, silence throughout the day. Now, silence can mean a lot of things, right? And we're going to talk a little bit about that. But throughout history, we've had silence has been associated with religion and it's been spirituality and intellectual states. Silence. Compared to the East, the Western mind struggles some with that. We're renowned for talking. In different parts of the country is even more renowned for talking. I grew up in Wisconsin where <clears throat> when we go to the farm, there wasn't a lot of conversation that went on. We'd sit around in the chairs because the food was in the barn all the casseroles and the jellos and the desserts and everybody made something. And they sat around and yeah, they talked often about the weather because the crops, right? There was a lot of just sitting, a lot of space between conversations, be between thoughts. And anymore, we pretty much step over each other to say what's on our mind. all the time, all the time. And because we're stepping over each other to say something that I have a thought of or a question of this, I haven't been thinking about what you just said to me, really. Silence is revered in Christian, Jewish, Buddhist, Hindu, and Islamic faith. It's not something new. We are constantly inundated with communication without true connection and wealth of information without wisdom. Think about all the conversations you have. 
There might be some wisdom in there, but my guess is there hasn't been enough time to process, to integrate, to be with what's being shared. And so we breeze right through conversations. We don't even notice what we're going to say the next moment because we're so busy thinking about what someone may have started to say but hasn't finished to say. We are simply not built, this human body, to process the amount of information and socialization that we're getting. It's increased. You know, most of us can remember a time when all there was was a phone on the wall. And maybe a, a TV in the room. And when I tried to, and my brothers tried to help my mom get a computer, it lasted about a week. It was back to what? She wrote notes. And every other week I got a written note, just a note card. And also often a $20 bill. Mom being mom. And back then I used to say, wow, that'll put gas in my tank. Now, not so much. Neurologically, our bodies can't take it. They can't take it. There are MRIs and fMRIs that indicate how disturbed our bodies are. Is it any wonder that it's, for some of us, many of us, have difficulty going to sleep at night. Sometimes because we've just been doing what? Looking at our phones, looking at our iPads, looking at our computers, watching TV. And we know, scientists have told us, certainly the neurologist that I've gone to with Venerable has said, you do that and you're not going to get good rest. You're not going to get good rest. Now, of course, you say, well, it puts me to sleep. But that has integrated into your system. So that's what's also in there. And our bodies are struggling to calm down, to rest, to nurture, to relax. We're not doing this beautiful vessel any service by doing all that we're doing now. The dominant narrative of success and happiness is one of constant and unrelenting productivity a wildly busy social life, and a never-ending list of accomplishments that keeps growing. That all famous and very important to-do list. I have a dear friend in Portland who calls me frequently during the week, especially now that I'm in recovery. I say, oh, I got to do this and this. And she said, well, make a checklist. And she is the queen of checklists. And they're helpful, but they're a driver or a driver of that energy. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. So different traditions have very similar approaches to silence. And we know that. I was considering silence with curiosity. And so I looked at <clears throat> Christian views of silence and others and solitude. And of course, the role model was Jesus. And so I looked in the gospel. In the book of James, it's quoted, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And in Gospels, continually Jesus withdrew from people, daily life activities, and the demands of his ministry to be alone and pray. His ongoing intimate relationships with his Abba was a source of his compassion, wisdom, and power. The secret sauce. I found it everywhere in the Gospels. It's how he made Jesus important decisions, dealt with troubling emotions, the demands of his work and care for his soul. It's how he prepared for important events and for his death. In the Gospel of Mark, it's highlighted that he goes to the mountain, the desert, the sea, the lake, to be in solitude and pray. I spent a fair amount of time reading the desert fathers and mothers, I still do, and they were focused on silence. 
and solitary life in the desert. And yet, there were many that would go out to the desert and ask for a word and pray. Many of you I know go for walks, some of you up in the mountains, some of you in the forest. The trees can speak to you, and so can other beings. The Trappist monk Thomas Merton really, really focused on contemplative, not illumination, but prayer, which is illumination. And of course, Thomas Keating brought us centering prayer. The Quakers worship began in the very beginning with pastors or clergy leading. I'm sorry, without pastors or clergy. It was a simple gathering where friends would seek to hear what the spirit of the living God had to say in their minds. Out of the silence, a friend would speak when they felt led by the spirit to share what they heard in their hearts. Contemplative? Illumination? I think so. William Penn, remember him from your history? Very famous early Quaker. He wrote, true silence is the rest of the mind and is to the spirit what sleep is to the body. It is nourishment and refreshment. In the silence, I am trying to center myself, which means to lay aside distractions of the world, to listen carefully to the inward teacher, the inward guide, the inner Christ, and within me, which is also beyond me. And then there's Buddhism. The Buddha was an advocate of silence, of course, and as an alternative to idle tattle, chatter, he says, that often takes place in social context. Idle chatter. If it's quiet, what do people do? They start talking. Discomfort. Idle chatter. That comes from the Buddha. He also encouraged silence in the face of anger and provocation. How often do we want to go, Rah! right? We see it coming, we feel it coming, we hear it coming, and we're getting ready. We're getting ready. But the Buddha says silence. Back in the day, it was bite your tongue. And of course, he would go into solitude for long periods of time. He would also, and this is a critical piece I want us to consider and think about, he would maintain silence when he knew that the questions were not in a position to understand. And the answer, because of its profundity, or if the question themselves were wrongly put in the first place. Were wrongly put in the first place. I don't know about you, but there have been times when I may have asked Venerable a question. And if she says anything, she may just say, think about it. Think about it. For Buddha, by realizing the true nature of the issues asked, he remained silent. He remained silent. So what is the power of silence by Buddha? It takes on many forms. And the one we can quickly go to is saying on the cushion, at retreat. But silence can be just sitting at home with nothing on. It could be sitting in the car with nothing on. You can be waiting for appointments. And let me tell you, I've been at appointments. And you know, not one time, and I looked at this, not one time in the last four weeks was there ever, there were a number of people in the waiting room. Not one person didn't have their phone out and was looking at it. 
they sit down and the first thing they do is pull out that phone and start scanning. You go in out, the last visit I had, Rosita took me and I went in without my phone. It was with me, but I went in without my phone. And I ended up waiting 30 minutes, which was unusual for this particular doctor, my surgeon. And I just sat there. And I, of course, was taking stock of what was going on in my body because there was a week and a half time where I couldn't take that deep breath and I just did it without any pain. So I noticed that. And when I took that breath, I noticed the breath. And I sat. And there was a moment of agitation. And I looked at my watch and went, hmm, 15 minutes. She's usually not late at all. And then it was 20. And then I stopped. I said, Leave it alone. I had to talk to myself. Leave it alone. Just sit. And then I heard the knock, and away we went. First thing was, how are you feeling? I said, well, I don't know. I don't know how I'm supposed to be feeling after this surgery. So that changed the whole conversation. Words can create more noise, and that always lends itself to clear thinking. So I encourage you, invite you, and challenge you before you speak. Are you adding to noise? Are you adding to noise? When Buddha asked by a wandering ascetic, Vashagata, a series of questions, the Buddha replied, I'm not of that view, Vata. I'm not of that view, Vata. He responded that the many questions do not lead to giving up turning away, dispassion, stopping, calming, higher knowledge, to awakening nor to nirvana, and said that trying to answer such questions would just distract attention from the things that really matter. Now, I ask you, are you ready to debate that, or can you sit with that? Are you ready to yes, but me, or can you just sit with that? Just consider for a moment. Just consider what that means for you. Especially if you're inclined to want to talk. Of course, there are always good times to talk. It's not to say we can never talk. We haven't seen Sarah for a while. Of course, we're going to talk with her. We're going to want to hear about the trip. We're going to maybe not hear about the trip home. <laughs> but really, even think about that. When you ask Sarah, think about the question you want to ask. And when Sarah answers, Sarah, think about the answers that you want to give. So we are surrounded by faith traditions and a long history of silence and contemplation. With time, silence offers us an opportunity to settle like trying to peer into a pond that's been churned up by a storm. It's murky. You can't see at the bottom. All those raindrops distort the surface of the water. But when the downpour subsides and everything becomes calm, our mind, like the pond, becomes clear. Oh, I also invite you to look at your pond. Is it stirred up? Is it murky? Didn't rain. I don't know why it's murky. Look at your day. What have you been doing? Have you taken a moment? 
Have you been with yourself? Have you found ease? It's not easy to pull all of this off. We're human beings with eons of coming around. But here we are with this incredible dharma, with this incredible opportunity. And true nature is right there. Right there. What are we waiting for? Why do we keep going back on that treadmill? over and over again. This time, if you're at the airport, instead of on the treadmill, I'll just walk. But are we just walking? No, we're powering through in the airport. Right? Rightly so these days at airports. But nevertheless, get off the treadmill. If this really is something you want for yourself, Buddhism offers us tools to cultivate and aspire to these practices. Finding the right tools is a challenge. But once found, and if you focus and persevere, it will establish itself. It will establish itself. The freedom of liberation is available, and it is up to us to do the work of uncovering our true nature. So, so far, I'm doing pretty well. So I'm going to continue for a little bit more. So I'm going to talk about maturing our practice of silence. And there's a reason why I'm talking about silence. And it's because of what Sukha said about preparing to do contemplative rajna. This is all preparing us so that when we do focus principally on doing contemplative illumination, we're going to be ready. We can't be ready if we have just been on the phone and then race in, sit down to do the practice. We can't be ready if we spent the whole day chattering with this person and that person on the phone and over here at the grocery store. And I, although those are all okay. But that doesn't help us get to that place where we want to be when we prepare ourselves. So I encourage you, look at how you live your life. Look at how you engage with your life. Silence comes from many forms and can be wielded skillfully or unskillfully. We can withhold. We can sit quietly and not say anything, but our mind is going off. Silence is important in how we hold it. We just say, I'm just gonna be quiet, but then we continue to do the phone or the iPad or the computer, you're not resting the body, you're not resting the mind, and you're not preparing, you're not building that muscle. Ultimately, the silence we're trying to cultivate is inner silence. The stability of mind that can be carried with us no matter whatever the condition we find ourselves in. So when we stabilize ourselves, and when we walk out, when we walk into the world, away from whatever that silence was, whether it's just getting out of the car, we're ready. We're fortified. We've built that muscle just a little bit more. To truly tap into the inner quiet place, be sure you're not still immersed in your daily life looking at your phone every few minutes, checking your email, working, texting, meaningless talk, as the benefits of silence of contemplation are greatly reduced. Just consider that. Now, for some of us, that that's our 
in our right pocket and it's in our hand. Certainly the people I've worked with in my professional world, wherever they went, the phone went. And part of that was because those of us that weren't in the classroom had to have access to communicating. But it didn't just stop at school. It went home. And uh, and uh, sometimes I would come home and my partner had the TV going, talking on the phone, making dinner. And I walked in and I was like, too much, too much. Let me go back to what Buddha Master says. One should contemplate Come to understand and practice according to such principles. What principles? The three we talked about. Language prajna, intrinsic reality prajna, contemplative illumination prajna. What gets in the way of our prajna, intrinsic reality that is prajna? Karmic hindrances born of avidya since beginningless time. In order for intrinsic reality to appear, you must forget both personhood and dharmas and realize that emptiness of the six great elements. And in the end, you must let go of the dharma you have learned. You must go beyond words where the path of language is cut off, where you yourself directly attain realization and awakening. In order to realize your original nature, you must cut off the path of language and extinguish attachments to mental activity. Let's take some time to be with silence. I'm just going to let you be. I just invite you to just relax your neck and shoulders and every cell in your body. And let the entire body quiet down completely. When you hear sounds from outside like dogs barking, the sound of a car passing, or even the person breathing next to you, listen to them as a sound of silence. Consider it a sound of silence. If you tell yourself there are a lot of noisy things going on out there, then that's what you'll hear. If you keep listening to the sound of silence in everything, staying completely relaxed, you will hear it as silence. Hear the silence in the mountains and rivers, the great wide earth, the sky. Eventually, the whole universe will fall into deep silence. Perceive that same deep silence in yourself. Consider there is no sound whatsoever. Every thought returns into silence and becomes still.
We look with uncertainty beyond the old choices for clear-cut answers to a softer, more permeable aliveness, which is every moment at the brink of death, for something new is being born in us if we but let it. We stand at a new doorway, awaiting that which comes, daring to be human creatures vulnerable to the beauty of existence, learning to love. We dedicate whatever merit there may be resulting from this collective gathering and the study of the Dharma to all beings equally. May all beings increase their fortune and wisdom and may they always have peace and auspiciousness. Thank you, everyone.